we got an update kinda before we get into today's video i do want to let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life in your home in the grocery store and especially in the comment section down below please do not show hate to anybody anywhere Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had a wonderful week and I hope everybody's doing good and getting geared up for the weekend. So in today's video, we are going to be talking about the update-ish in the Natalie Holloway case. Now I'm gonna go through this video and I'm gonna give you guys a rundown of one of the versions of what happened. There are so many different twists and turns and people involved in this case. It is truly hard to put together like one documentary or one video because there's so many different things out there. This case has been so convoluted and there's been so much corruption involved in different areas having to do with the Natalie Holloway case that I'm just going to do the best that I can with the storyline that makes the most sense to me. And then we're going to talk about the updates and things that have happened. Now, I have been requested to do this case for years. However, I just kind of feel like everybody knows about this case, the Natalie Holloway situation. This happened whenever I was young in like my late teenage years, early 20s, when it was really blowing up. And this was before social media became so involved in our lives the way that it is now. But there's been so much new stuff that has come out since then, and especially dealing with the main suspects. So I'm gonna give you guys a brief overview of the case in this video. Then I'm gonna tell you some things that has happened since then and the latest update. And I'm gonna be giving y'all all my opinions in this video. Before we go any further, I did want to stop and thank today's sponsor, Hello fresh check saving money off of your growing to-do list with the help of HelloFresh. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% cheaper than ordering takeout. And no worries if you're not a pro in the kitchen because HelloFresh's foolproof recipes arrived pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps. And with HelloFresh, there is no more scouring the grocery store for that one ingredient to complete your recipe. HelloFresh takes away all the hassle by delivering fresh, pre-portioned ingredients so you have exactly what you need and it helps you cut down on food waste. On this day, I made HelloFresh's cheesy plant-based protein tostadas and they were so delicious. When they were done and I pulled them out of the oven, they were nice and crispy, full of delicious flavor and packed full of 30 grams of protein per serving. And they were quick and super easy to make and minimal cleanup. So delicious. If you get a chance to try these, I highly recommend. This is so good. You guys have to try this. Listen to this crunch. If you want to try HelloFresh, all you gotta do is go to HelloFresh.com and use code ChristinaRandall16 and you can get 16 free meals plus free shipping. Yes, just go to HelloFresh.com and use code ChristinaRandall16 and find out how you can get 16 free meals plus free shipping today. Thanks again, HelloFresh. So let's just start with Euron. Euron van der Sloot was born on August 6th of 1987 in the Netherlands, and he was one of three sons to Paulus van der Sloot, who was a lawyer, and Anita van der Sloot, who was an art teacher. In 1990, Euron and his family moved to Aruba, where he became an honor student. Now, this is something a lot of people may not know about Euron, if you're familiar with this whole entire situation, is he was a great student growing up. He made great grades. He was involved in sports and activities. He had a lot of friends. His teachers loved him. He was the apple of his parents' eye. He was destined 
for great things. Yaron was a soccer star and a tennis athlete at his school. He even competed in double tennis with his father at an anniversary cup in 2005. Yaron was even on his way to play for St. Leo University. Yaron's teenage girlfriend even spoke out about how loving and romantic he was. We like looking into each other's eyes. What did you see when you looked into his eyes? I saw a very honest person and he was very full of life, very, he was ambitious, he was smart. So. You were his first big love. Mm -hmm. So he said. Yaron's mother would say as he got older, this is when he began to rebel and started to act out. He was going to like casinos, he was drinking a lot, and he began to get into trouble. Now let's bring it to the disappearance of Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway infamously ran into Yaron in 2005 when she was on a high school graduation trip in Aruba. Let me give you guys a little rundown about who Natalie was first, just in case you're not familiar. Natalie was the first of two children born to Dave and Beth Holloway in Memphis, Tennessee. Her parents divorced in 1993 and she and her younger brother Matthew were raised by their mother. In 2000, Beth married a man named George, a prominent Alabama businessman, and the family moved to Mountain Brook, Alabama. Natalie was a member of the National Honor Society at her school. She made great grades. She graduated with honors and she was on her way to have a full ride scholarship to college all expenses paid, a good girl, lots of friends. Now, looking back at this, hindsight is always 2020, right? Back in 2005, I can't really talk about much because y'all know what I was doing in 2005. I was on my way down the road, okay? But Natalie was on her way to a graduation trip, a high school graduation trip with the other graduates to Aruba. Talk about a graduation trip, right? It was like 130 students, okay, that went to Aruba or were going to Aruba and 11 chaperones, 11. Now, mind you, in Aruba in 2005, I don't know what it is now, but in 2005, the legal drinking age there is only 18. So you got a bunch of 18 year olds, freshly graduated, you're taking them to Aruba. They took them to an all-inclusive resort, which had all the food, but also all the alcohol that they could want included with 11 chaperones. So looking back at it, that really seems like a terrible idea, but nevertheless, all the students were excited, as you can imagine, and the parents thinking that they're just sending their kids on this exciting graduation trip that they had earned, you know what I mean? They're all good kids. They didn't worry about anything. There are videos all over the internet and plenty of documentaries that show that Natalie had a phenomenal time. There's videos of her riding in the back of the car talking about they spent all day on the beach. I mean, they were eating, they were drinking, they were going to the casinos there, they were meeting people, they were having a blast. They had the time of their life. But for some reason, I guess some of the girls decided on their last night there that they were going to go out with a bang, honey. Before they came back to the U.S. and before they had to go to college and go through years of more schooling, they was going to make that last night a night to remember. And Natalie was no different. The students were scheduled to fly home or be at the airport on May 30th of 2005. So on the night of May 29th of 2005, which I swear, again, hindsight's 2020, you think the chaperones would be going around making sure everybody's packed up, everybody's in bed, because we gotta literally fly back to America tomorrow, which is a long flight. You gotta go through customs, you gotta make sure everything's right. But nevertheless, the girls were out and Natalie was out. She came across Yaron and she met him in a bar and they drank and they danced together and they were just having a good time. When the bar that Natalie was at in Aruba closed at 1 a.m., she was last seen leaving in a car with Yaron and two of his friends that were brothers, 21-year-old Deepak Kalpo and 18-year-old Satish Kalpo. The next day, when all these students, you can imagine, they're rubbing their eyes, they're tired, they're dragging their bags, they're you know drained from the sun, drained from the liquor, drained from everything else, they get to the airport, y'all and they're doing a head count. Nobody can find Natalie. Can you imagine the panic? Can you imagine the panic of the chaperones? Can you imagine the girls that are like, wait a minute, where's Natalie at? Nobody can find her, so she misses her flight. When Natalie's parents found out that she did not show up to the airport to come home, she missed her flight, and nobody had seen or heard from her, they immediately got on a plane and flew over to Aruba 
to look for her. I mean, talk about, first of all, having the resources to do that, but also they didn't waste any time. Getting off the plane, probably hoping that she was gonna be there saying, oh, I got drunk and fell asleep somewhere, but they get there to look for her and they still cannot find her. When they landed in Aruba, they went to the hotel that Natalie was staying at and they met with the manager who gave them Yaron's name after recognizing him on the security camera footage. Natalie's mother and stepfather went straight to Yaron's home with two Arubian police officers and asked him if they knew where Natalie was. Yaron initially denied knowing Natalie's name, but then he told a story. He said that he and his two friends, those brothers, drove Natalie to a lighthouse because she wanted to see sharks. Then later they dropped her off at a hotel at around 2 a.m. Yaron said Natalie fell down as she got out of the car, but refused his help. He said that as they were driving away, Natalie was approached by a dark man in a black suit. The description of the dark man in the black suit fit the people that worked at the hotel. So then the police went and they started interrogating all of the people that worked at the hotel trying to see if they had seen Natalie. They could find no connection, nobody that had seen her, and no proof on any of the security camera footage that Natalie ever even came back. So on June 9th of 2005, Yaron and the two brothers were arrested in connection of the disappearance of Natalie Holloway. I remember when they got arrested and I remember Yaron being like plastered all over everything and his pictures. Even I thought because of the back and forth with him and them letting him go that maybe he was just some young guy that had met her at a bar and some way somehow she disappeared. Maybe he didn't have anything to do with it because again, this is back before we could have access to all the information like we could have now. But now that I know everything, I'm like, oh my goodness. However, due to lack of evidence, the judge ended up releasing the two brothers a month later. And at that time, Yaron stayed in custody while they continued to question him and pressure him about the disappearance of Natalie. The brothers ended up being rearrested in August on suspicion of the R word, but then in September of that year, all three of them were released again due to lack of evidence. So it kind of seemed like the cops were trying to get them on something, but could not hold them long enough. And so they, all three of them ended up you know, going free. A former deputy of the Aruba police force stated that the initial arrests were made prematurely under the pressure from Natalie's family. He said that the family actually sidetracked the whole investigation because they came there, they were actually putting missing posters up of their daughter saying $100,000 for information about Natalie, but a million dollars if you can get her back to them alive. So you can just imagine when you have a country, especially back then, again, 2005, and you've got these posters everywhere, $100,000 for any kind of information. You got people calling in about everything. Every little blonde girl that they'd done seen, drunk, falling around somewhere, somebody's calling in trying to get that $100,000. So because of all the media attention and everything going on, the Arubian police said that they messed up the investigation. Mind you, Natalie's parents think that the Arubian cops dropped the ball. So, I mean, they're both like saying, no, it's your fault. No, you had something to do with it. No, da, 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 da. On September 26th of 2005, Yaron went on a TV show in America named A Current Affair. And while he was on this television show, this is when he said that neither himself or the brothers had any kind of relations with Natalie, but that they had all agreed to lie to the authorities. What are your, your memories of Natalie like? I don't really have that many memories. I mean, I, I knew her for one night. I feel super. I feel horrible that I even went out that night without my father knowing. I should have just stayed home, and this wouldn't have happened to me. It was Natalie who asked me to go out with her. It was her that asked me to come to the club. Um, it was her that was yelling at me to go dance with her, and I said, and I went to go drink something with my friends. Are you that irresistible? I mean, is that what? No, I, I don't know. That's not. That's absolutely not what it's about. I don't know. I, I, when her parents showed up at my door with her picture, I didn't even know who Natalie Holloway was. I didn't even know her name. It's all her. It's, I'm not saying it's all her. I, I liked her. I, I thought she was very attractive, and I went out with her. How do you leave a girl on the beach? Very irresponsible. I know, and that's the one thing I would like to take back. But at the time, it, at the time it just didn't seem wrong. And then what happened? You just said, oh, I've got to go home and study. I've got to go home because I've got to get up for class tomorrow. Uh, I told her I, I had to go home. I had school the next day, and I, I thought maybe she'd understand. She told me no, she wanted me to stay there with her because the next day she was leaving, and she, she wanted to stay there the whole night. 
I told her no, I had to go. I even I even lifted her up to carry her back to her hotel, and she she told me to put her down. I left her there. I sat down next to her, talked to her a while, and I called Deepak to ask him if he could come pick me up, which Deepak didn't do. But how did you feel when you left her? Well, at the time I didn't I didn't feel it was a bad idea. At the time I really didn't. It didn't seem wrong. It didn't seem. Of course, now I look back at it and I think I would, I'm, a, I'm an ass. What did I do? But there's nothing I can do about it now. If I'd have that moment back, I would have made sure she got back to her hotel safely. But I can't. I can't change that now. Did you have sex with her that night? That's first of all. That's none of your business. It's just a question. Yes, but it's absolutely none of your business. Well, what? I mean, did anything else happen that night? No. Well, yes, I, I, I kissed with her, but neither me, Deepak, or Satish ever had sex with her, and no one ever, ever said otherwise. And that's the last thing that happened? Yes. That's the last and thing what was the last thing that she said to you? Um, the, I, she didn't say any last thing to me. The last thing I said to her was bye. Later that month, while Yaron and his father were actually in New York filming for a different interview, they got served with paperwork for a lawsuit from Natalie's parents claiming personal injury. Now, can you guys imagine, okay? Can you imagine your daughter going on this trip? She's got this beautiful life ahead of her. She goes on this graduation trip with her friends, having a blast, taking all these pictures, all these videos, hanging out with the girls by the beach. She disappears. This is the main suspect. Now he's in America on national television, on your television show, doing interviews, honey, making money, like selling his interviews. Can you imagine the like, disgust from the family because at this point they really believe that he had he was the last person seen with her and now he's telling all these lies and every time you talk to him he's got a different story so they served him with a lawsuit while he was with his father in the big apple now mind you something that i forgot to mention in the beginning of this was not only was his father already in law enforcement he was actually training to be a judge so his father had connections now even though they served him with this lawsuit a judge ended up throwing it out anyway so so Natalie's parents are theoretically getting smacked in the face every time they turn around. Then, to make matters worse, in 2007, just two years after the disappearance of Natalie Holloway, Yaron and a reporter get together and publish a book describing the case. So here he is making more money off of this tragedy. And in the introduction of the book, he starts the book off by saying, I see this book as my opportunity to be open and honest about everything that happened for anyone who wants to read it. Okay, let's keep going here. On April 27th of 2007, a new search involving around 20 investigators was launched at Yaron's parents' home in Aruba. Dutch authorities searched the yard and surrounding area using shovels and thin metal rods to probe in the ground. A spokesman for the prosecutor's office stated, the investigation has never stopped and the Dutch authorities are completely reviewing the case for new indications. Then, just a few months later, in November of 2007, Yaron and those two brothers were actually arrested by the Arubian police for voluntary manslaughter. And it was with great bodily harm resulting in the death of Natalie Holloway. And this is because the Arubian prosecution said that there was new incriminating evidence that tied them to the death of Natalie Holloway. So these are big charges. So you can only imagine Natalie's parents are like, finally, they are arrested for something. But then in December, the case gets thrown out and they all three get released because of lack of evidence. Then on January 11th of 2008, Yaron went on a, another talk show. And this is where he was challenged by a Dutch talk show host and it didn't go so well. A former suspect in the Natalie Holloway case, Euron Van der Sloot, he got into a bit of a spat on a Dutch talk show. Let's take a look at the video. At the end of this live TV interview about the case, Van der Sloot grabbed a glass of red wine that was on the table and he threw it in the reporter's face. Let's see this in action. I hope it comes up. But uh, the reporter had been grilling him about Holloway's disappearance and apparently questioned Van der Sloot's honesty. The reporter says, wow. Goes. Reporter uh, says Van der Sloot later apologized, but it was kind of burning in the reporter's face. Now this whole time, there's like this undercover stuff going on with Yaron. They had allegedly like 
launched a full investigation. I know that Natalie Holloway's parents had hired private investigators. I mean, they were doing everything that they could. They would watch the boys get arrested, get released, get arrested, get released, continue to get in trouble, go on talk shows, sell books, all of this stuff while they're hurting. But yet there were some undercover stuff going on and that's when the first undercover video came out in February of 2008. Now this was on February 3rd and this is Yaron smoking some green and talking about how he was there when Natalie's life ended. This show was watched by 7 million viewers in the Netherlands and was the most popular non-sports program in now, Yaron was unaware that he was being taped while he told his undercover friend that Natalie actually had a seizure while he was having relations with her. He said that they were on the beach and that he could not revive her. Now, he has told so many stories. I think, and I'm going to tell you guys more of what I think happened at the end, but I think this, I think this one has some truth in it. I do think somebody helped him, but I'm going to tell you guys more about that. But in this video, he really didn't want to tell the person's name. He said he would never tell the person's name that helped him, but he was saying that basically, thank God they never found Natalie's body or he would be toast. Even though that seems like a confession, one of many different stories that he's told, including even the book where he wanted to be honest, right? Prosecution said that this was not admissible in court. They could not use this as a way to convict him. And then when Yaron was questioned about it, he said that the guy that was undercover, you know, he believed that he was a drug dealer and he was just trying to impress him. So basically at this point, Yaron can get on camera and tell a million different stories, a million different things that he says happens and they can't do anything because as long as there's not any proof that that actually happened, like they don't have, I guess, a body at this point or a way to prove it, it didn't really matter and they couldn't prosecute him. By September of that year, the pressure had became so hard on Yaron, he voluntarily checked himself into a psychiatric hospital. Once he was out of the clinic, Yaron moved to Bangkok and bought a restaurant. In November of 2008, an investigator aired undercover footage of Yaron making plans to traffic Thai women in Bangkok to Europe. It was claimed that Yaron was making $13,000 for every woman sold into the Netherlands and Yaron had been using the alias Murphy Jenkins to avoid Thai authorities. At the same time, Thailand was pursuing criminal charges against Yaron. According to the media, he was being investigated by Thai authorities for his involvement in a disappearance of a young woman while posing as a production consultant for a modeling agency where he claimed to be sending women to to Europe to work as models. When I found out that piece of information, I immediately thought about Tabo Bester. Did you guys watch this video right here? If you haven't, go and watch it. It is so wild and I need to do an update on it. But Tabo Bester got started doing that same thing, luring, you know, young women in to be models, robbing them, doing whatever, whatever with them. And at, at around the exact same time, which is so bizarre to me. So anyways, this is what Yaron was allegedly doing. And the Thai authorities were investigating him for trafficking women and selling them for money under this alias as Murphy. In early 2010, Yaron's father passed away. After Yaron's father's death, he sold his Bangkok restaurant business and returned to Aruba. So now we got to talk about Yaron's father, Paulus. Paulus Vandersloot was arrested on June 22nd, 2005, in connection with the disappearance of Natalie Holloway. But then just three days later after questioning, he was released. According to Aruba's chief prosecutor, one of the Calpo brothers had told them that Paulus, Yaron's father, had actually helped him dispose of the body. However, without a body, they couldn't prove anything. 
They could not prove that Paulus was involved or that Iran actually did it. Then on November 10th of 2005, Paulus won an unjust detention case against the Arubian government, clearing him as a suspect. Paulus then brought a second case seeking monetary damages for himself and his family because of the false arrest. The case was initially won. So initially Paulus won $40,000 in Arubian money, which was like $22,300 in American money. So I want you guys to imagine Natalie's parents too, finding this out. Like, they're like, wait a minute, now they're winning all this money and they sell da, 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 all of this stuff going on. However, it was reversed, so he didn't end up getting the money. But I mean, that was another just crazy twist to this whole case. Then in November of 2008, Fox News showed an interview where Yaron said that he sold Natalie into a ring. He also said that he received money when Natalie was taken and then also later he received money to keep quiet. He also said that he paid those Calpo brothers to help him. He also said that his father paid off two police officers and this was a real big rumor and that Natalie was taken to Venezuela. So again here's another story. Another complete like you don't know what what actually happened here. The show also aired part of an audio recording provided by Yaron that he alleged was a phone conversation between himself and Paulus, his father, where Paulus displayed knowledge of his son's alleged involvement. However, according to the prosecutor, the other voice heard on the recording was not his father, Paulus. He said that he was certain that it was Yaron speaking in a lower voice. Can you imagine? The prosecution is listening to this recording of Yaron, who is saying that he's talking to his father and they're listening to it and they're believing that it's Yaron talking to himself and pretending to be his father. Oh my gosh, his father ends up passing away later in 2010 of a heart attack while playing tennis, which I mean, if his father was innocent, I mean, I feel like it, it, it makes sense that his heart gave out. I mean, because... Holy cow. And then Anita, Yaron's mother, said that Yaron had serious mental problems, which is pretty obvious, but she also said that he blamed himself for his father's death, which I don't know how that works scientifically, but I mean, she said that she was going to have her son involuntarily committed to a facility, but that he left before she could. And he left her a note saying, I'm gone. Don't worry. Now we get to 2010 where the charges in the U.S come from. Around March 29th of 2010, Yaron allegedly contacted Beth Holloway, Natalie's mother's representative, her legal representative. He contacts the representative and says, listen, I can give you information about Natalie Holloway and I can tell you where her body is. I can give you info, but I'm going to need $250,000. Can you believe the nerve? Now, Natalie's parents being desperate five years after the disappearance of their daughter at this point. I just think about too, like you guys know, Natalie's parents, they had a son as well, or have a son. So they have Natalie as their oldest, and then they have a son who you can just imagine. I mean, obviously the son is innocent in this, just like so many other people, but you can imagine what that son went through growing up as well too, right? With his parents being all consumed with the disappearance of the sister, as well as him dealing with the trauma of that and trying to live somewhat of a normal life with the media in his face and all of that, like, ugh. nevertheless, here comes Yaron contacting them to get some money out of them. Yaron wanted a $25,000 down payment. So what happened was the representative said that he secretly flew to Aruba to meet Yaron because they weren't gonna just, you know, give him the money from America. They were gonna go to Yaron and this is where they gave, the representative gave him $100. Like, look, I'm serious. Then on May 10th, Yaron allegedly accepted a wire transfer of $15,000 to his account in the Netherlands following a cash payment of $10,000 that was videotaped by an undercover investigator in Aruba. In exchange, Yaron told the representative that his father buried Natalie's remains in the foundation of their house. Authorities determined that this information was false because the house had not yet been built at the time of Natalie's disappearance. Yaron later emailed the representative saying he did in fact lie about the house. You would think that they would immediately go and arrest him, but they didn't. 
And this is when Beth Holloway, Natalie's mom, lost her ever-loving mind again because she's like, you have extortion. This is enough to arrest him. You got the wire transfer. You got him on videotape taking the money. But nope, he took the money and he ran. Again, he's done television shows. This is all in five years, you guys. He's done, wrote a book. His daddy's done died. He done lied on his daddy. Like, get this man off the streets. He's dangerous. But nope, he took that $25,000 and ran. I can't imagine Natalie's parents. The FBI and the U.S. attorney said that the case hadn't been sufficiently developed enough for them to file charges. But then on June 3rd of 2010, almost a month later, this is when the extortion charges were finally filed. Not when he was there, when they had their eyes on him, a month later. The U.S. issued a warrant through Interpol to have him prosecuted in the United States. On June 4th, Dutch authorities raided and confiscated items from two homes belonging to Iran in the Netherlands. In an interview on September 6th of 2010, Iran admitted the extortion. I was doing a lot of things that I, I, shouldn't, have been, I shouldn't have been doing and mostly only going out all the night and sleeping all the day. I have always been very, uh, how you call it, uh, um, impulsive. Always been uh, take a action right away, make a decision immediately, and not think about what the consequences are. There were people were paying me to, paying me to, yeah, to make up stories, and I was really good at making up stories. Everybody keeps coming at you, asking you questions, asking you stuff, and. Yeah, you don't know something, and finally you, you start to think, okay, well, well you. If, you, if you want something, then, then I'll tell you whatever you want to hear, sure. I misused the situation for my own advantage, and I feel bad about that, and if I could change that, I, I, I would take it back for sure. And in 2012, a judge finally deemed Natalie deceased, because at this point, she was gone for seven years, nobody knew where her body was, and so she was deemed dead. Now, on May 30th of 2010, just happened to be five years to the day of the disappearance of Natalie Holloway, a woman named Stephanie Flores, who was 21 years old, died at a hotel in Lima. On June 2nd, a hotel employee found her beaten and bruised body in room 309. When they went to go investigate and they looked at the security camera footage, guess who they seen walking into the room with her? Yaron. So literally five years to the day of Natalie Holloway's disappearance, he beat a woman in a hotel and left her body there. Stephanie, who just happened to be one year from graduating at her university as a businesswoman, her father came out and said that her car was found and parked about 50 blocks from the hotel where her body was found, and in it they found the date drug. Her jewelry, money, identification, and credit cards were all missing, including about $1,000 her father had given her to buy a laptop and over $10,000 she had won earlier at the casino. You know, kind of like the same place that Natalie was hanging out. The Peruvian police named their only suspect in the murder of Stephanie, and it was Yaron. Interpol issued a warrant for his arrest, believing that he had fled to go to Chile. Now, when the police finally got a hold of Yaron, when they was questioned about it, then he he gave the story, I can't with this guy. He gave the story that he was in the room, a bunch of burglars busted in the room and he hid while they killed Stephanie and he had nothing to do with it. Okay. He was arrested, thrown in a cell where he was eventually put on end it all watch and he was only allowed to call his mother. Police went into a full fledged investigation on the case with Stephanie and this is when they realized that she had won all this money at the casino. Ugh, so sad. I mean, you can imagine she was so excited. She's young. She won $10,000. She's with this guy. She thinks she likes him. They found the surveillance footage of him going into the room, but leaving with her bags. An odd Topsy ruled that Stephanie did not have sex before she passed away, but the autopsy revealed some very brutal details about her body. She suffered blunt force trauma to her head, which caused a brain hemorrhage, cranial fracture, and a broken neck. She also suffered significant injuries to her face and showed signs of asphyxiation. Stephanie did test positive for the presence of amphetamines, but the lab report doesn't show whether she took them willingly or unknowingly. The stains on Yaron's clothes match Stephanie's blood 
blood type and blood was also found on the floor, the hallway, and mattress in the hotel room. On June 7th of 2010, Yaron initially denied having anything to do with it, although he's literally on camera. He has this track record. He still lied and denied it. But after hours of interrogation, he gave them a story, which I still don't even believe, but I'm going to tell you because it's the best they got and it's what they got him on, okay? He said that he left the room to go get coffee, snacks, or something. And he returned and Stephanie was using his laptop without his permission. He said she'd opened the laptop and was reading all the stuff about Natalie, this guy, I tell you what, and that... He snapped. He said she didn't have any right to be doing that and he completely snapped and he didn't mean to. I don't believe that for a second. I think he raw I think he, he saw her with all the money. I think he sweet talked her and I think that he robbed her. I think maybe she caught him in his stuff and he did what he did. During this confession, the police said that he let it slip that he knew where Natalie's body was buried, which again, I I don't I don't believe him. I, I think I believe he knows exactly what happened to her, but I think that he used Natalie's case as leverage with anybody he could, whether it was to get money, whether it was allegedly to look cool, whatever. And uh, why would he let it slip in this case too? I mean, he's so manipulative. And to top it all off, Yaron later retracted his whole entire confession and said that the investigators and the police tricked him into signing all these documents and confessing and that didn't actually even happen. Nevertheless, he was charged with first degree murder and he was being held. While he was being held, a judge wanted him to get a psych evaluation. Hello, they should have been done that. But the psych evaluation came back that he showed traits of antisocial personality disorder and is indifferent towards others' well-beings. Nevertheless, on January 11th of 2012, Yaron pled guilty to the qualified murder and simple robbery of Stephanie. He was convicted and sentenced to 28 years and ordered to pay $75,000 to Stephanie's family. At that time, he was expected to be released on June 10th of 2012. 38. Since Yaron's been in prison, honey, he has not slowed down one bit either, okay? His, his cell has become a whole entire media circus where he's even talking about Natalie. I mean, this guy. On September 11th of 2010, Beth Holloway, Natalie's mother, and Peter, the investigator that came over to meet him and gave him that $100 with the wire transfer and all of that stuff we were talking about, Beth and Peter traveled to Peru with a Dutch television crew to visit the prison. A According to Yaron's attorney, Yaron was taken to meet them practically by force and that the meeting with Beth took less than one minute. Beth said that she told Yaron that she had no hate in her soul for him and asked about her daughter's disappearance. Yaron told her he couldn't answer her without his lawyer present and handed her his attorney's business card. I told you anything pertaining to the case, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about. Yaron's mother, who really had been through it too, said that she was not going to visit her son in prison because of the killing of Stephanie and that she wished that she could talk to Stephanie's family and apologize to them for what her son did. Then on July 4th of 2014, Yaron marries a Peruvian woman, which <laughs> you guys, uh, some woman done gone up there and fall in love with Yaron and she marries him while he's in prison with an end of sentence date at this point of 2038. She met Yaron while she was at the prison selling goods, okay? She met him while she's at the prison selling goods. When they got married, she was seven months pregnant with his child. Tell me how that happens. What, what are they doing over there in the Peruvian prison? It must be one of them types of prisons, right? And so then that all brings us to the current update because Yaron is about to take a trip to the United States, finally. Finally, he is going to be extradited over here for the extortion charges. Now, I don't know what all he's gonna get over here. That's for the $25,000. And he's probably gonna love it too. And get this. Allegedly, Yaron has been trying to fight his extradition because he says that he's innocent. This man just really says anything, don't he? But that he's eager, if he's going to be extradited, to come over here so he can prove his innocence for the extortion. That they got... <sighs> So what will happen is if he gets any time here, after the trial here, he'll be sent back to finish out his time there and then he'll have to come back here 
and finish out whatever time he gets here. And I could tell you all the other things about Yaron, about how he's got a whole new wife now and all this stuff. But nevertheless, I'm gonna tell y'all what I think happened with Natalie, okay? Do I think Yaron did it? Yes, I absolutely do. Back then, that's what I was saying in the beginning of this video. Back then, I just, because you would see, some of y'all watching this don't remember these times, but a lot of y'all are gonna remember. Before the internet was the way that it was, we read newspapers or we read the magazines in the stores. Every time you checked out, I mean, you would see the Natalie Holloway case. It was all over the news and stuff, but you could not miss her face. And then when he became the prime suspect, his face was all over everything too, but they kept releasing him for no evidence. So that's all most of us knew was like, they didn't have enough. And it kind of seemed like maybe they were just going after this young guy who was out partying. But now that you know all this, it's like, this is terrible. This is awful. Obviously, he had something to do with it, but what happened? I mean, I can tell y'all what I think. The police can say what they think. Natalie's parents can say what they think, but if nobody has any evidence, he got away with it. One thing that we know about Yaron is he lies, lies, and lies. Even when he's telling the truth, like when he said that he snapped on Stephanie and he beat her to death because it was computer, he lies right? Even if there's a sprinkle of truth, it's wrapped around in a lie. I don't believe that he ever took her to the beach that he said he took her to, because I don't think he would ever lead the police or the investigators to the spot where it was at. He took her somewhere, whether it was his house, whether it was a hotel, he was very well known as being a ladies man, somebody that would go to these like casinos or these bars and stuff and pick up women, typically young American girls, because he was one of the few people that spoke fluent English. So he would go meet these young tourists women that were a lot of the times couldn't drink over in the U.S. They were over there drinking and getting tore all the way up. And he would be like this, you know, foreigner that spoke really good English and he was tall and he was handsome to a lot of them. And he was known as a guy that would take them back to the hotels. Also back during that time, a substance called GHB was going around heavy. I remember it. Do y'all, a lot of y'all remember it? It was going around heavy back then in 2005 and he was known to be somebody that carried it with him. And I don't know if he actually killed her or if she overdosed, but he did something with her body. And I do believe it had something to do with somebody else, whether it was his dad or a friend. I think the name that he made up, the Dury, that helped him with the boat, I think somebody did help him with the boat, but I do not believe that he would ever give up the name. I think it was somebody else, and it may have been his father, since his father knew stuff, being, you know, a judge in training. Somebody helped him to get rid of the body, and I believe that he took it far, took her body far out in the ocean, and he dumped it, and he did know where the sharks were, okay? So I don't know. He said in that video that basically, if thank God they never found the body or it would be over. And I think that was a bit of truth. I think there's tiny bits of truth every now and then in his story. Some of his stories are complete BS. They're lies. They, 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 he's another one that they need to study his brain. But I absolutely believe he was involved in the disappearance and the death of Natalie Holloway. So what do you guys think? Did you think that he was involved back in the day? Do you think he's involved now? There, there were so many other rumors, you guys. Remember how I said that this story is so convoluted? I mean, there was a story about a DJ, because get this, there is a literal DJ at one of these nightclubs that came forward to the police and said that they seen Natalie Holloway get out of the car with them. He corroborated or corroborated Yaron's story and saw her approach the dark man in the dark suit, okay? Now, security cameras show that that is not true. It never happened. So why would this guy lie? He was never fully investigated, and he also owned a boat. He lived on a boat, so he could have taken her out. So there was all these other stories. I think that he owed a favor to Yaron or maybe Yaron's father or something, and that's why he went forward to corroborate the story, he ended up getting in trouble for lying to authorities later about that. But it's like there's all these other things in the mix that could make you wonder if Yaron did it, but I still think Yaron did it. I still think he did it. I think he's not a good person. So what do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section down below. I know this was a longer video. Let me know what y'all think. I love you guys. Y'all have a great weekend and I will see y'all soon. Bye.